Thank Wonderful. You. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Thank, you, shalom. Thank you, Rabbi Foster. Appreciate it. Rabbi, do we make a tachyam or something? Yeah, we can. A new baruch. And we should do the blessing for study. Do you begin with the blessing for study? Uh, you can. Yeah, is that okay? Thank you. Well, good morning, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And thanks for to those of you online for managing your, your mute button. Um, we all have gotten too used to that in the, the recent years. Um, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, I was living in Dallas, Texas, and I was serving as the associate rabbi at Temple Emmanuel there, which is a very large reform congregation, something around 2,600 families. And, and in two days, we said, how are we going to put services online for the congregation, <laughs> which I'm sure everybody had to figure that out. We were we were up all night for days and days, figuring we, we out- We were already streaming at that point. Right, all, well, we were too, but it wasn't, we weren't even in the building. We were all, I led services from my home office for I don't know how many months. It was, it was so odd, but I, it's great that we're in this environment where people can participate from around the country, around the world. I hear we have some folks from the far North regions of Canada. Is that right, Esther? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, and so if you're online, uh, we want you to feel part of this whole community. So just either raise your hand, wave at the screen, or just unmute to say, excuse me, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll moderate, and I'll help to kind of manage that for all of us. If we could just do once around the room with the first names, that would help me. Um, and, and then we'll begin. Marsha. Nina. Larry. Harvey. Judy. Bijan. Bob. Ron. Elliot. And the folks online, we can see your names there on the screen, which helps. So very good. Sheila. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Sheila. Can you, is the sound any better now, Sheila? It, it's, yeah. it's slightly off. It's better, but it, it's still, you're in a valley somehow. Okay. Yeah, but did you <laughs> notice you're looking up. You're looking up so that, yeah, so that the... Maybe okay. the voice, maybe the voice has to be that. I don't know. I'm not an. No, uh, it's fine. Person. It's you're looking down to them in a valley, but you, the the acoustics, the sound is fine. Okay, good, good. Well, we'll proceed with that, and we'll allow the, the higher and lower settings to be the uh, the metaphor for the heavenly Beit Midrash uh, uh, with uh, Hashem's presence with us this morning. Okay. <laughs> So very good. So here we find ourselves. And by the way, what I do now. So I, I, besides Torah study on Shabbat morning, which I love to join at Emmanuel, we had a wonderful culture of that. And it was one of my favorite things to do each week. But um, I, I work now at, at the JCC full time um, in a communal role as director of Camp Wise, which is our, our overnight camp in Chardon, Ohio. Um, so as I, as I was joking a moment ago, I said, we have great attendance in my congregation for three months out of the year. No one misses a service. <laughs> so, uh, and then we spend the rest of the year bringing them back to register and hire staff and work on the facility and teach and, and uh, engage them during the year. So it's a blessing to be here. Thank you for, for having other clergy involved. Um, so here we are, Parsha Tetzaveh. Mm -hmm. Parsha Tetzaveh in the book of Exodus. Um, the actual Parsha begins on page 503 in the Eitz Chaim commentary, if you're looking at that at home. Mm -hmm. I figured we would spend a little bit of time in the Parsha. Mm -hmm. And then I also want to spend some time, I brought more material, I brought a, a packet here, which those of you online, I didn't know the setup. I would have figured out how to screen share that for you. We won't read, for, if we read from this, we'll read out loud. Um, if not, we'll reference other pages in the book so that we're all on the same level. But this packet here is related to our Moftir portion today. Does anybody know what the Moftir is about today? It's a special Shabbat. Amalek. That's right, Amalek. Mm -hmm. Right, so this is Shabbat Zahor, and we'll mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit as well. So that's, which is a kind of a fun scavenger hunt. I figured that was the, the camp theme, a scavenger hunt through the Torah and through our biblical texts where Amalek is referenced. 
Um, okay, so why don't we begin on page 503. Do you, is the culture of the class, do you have someone who is a, a reader that reads the, reads the text aloud? Just ask for we, we can ask for a volunteer. We're not okay. generally volunteers. Hey, Esther, would you would you kick us off? No, I don't have the don't have the chumash in front of me, but Sheila generally Esther. kicks us off. Okay. It's Exodus 2720. 2720, page 503 in the Eitz Chaim. Would someone like to be our reader to begin? Do you want me to or not? Sure, that'd be great. That'd be great. Right. Go ahead. You shall further instruct the Israelites to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling lamps regularly. Aaron and his son shall set them up in the tent of meeting, outside the curtain, which is over the Ark of the Pact, to burn from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a due from the Israelites for all time throughout the ages. You shall be you shall bring forth your brother Aaron with his sons from among the Israelites to serve me as priests. Aaron, Nadav, and Abihu, Elazar, Itamar, the sons of Aaron, and Itamar, the sons of Aaron. Make sacral, sacral vestments for your brother Aaron for dignity and adornment. Next, you shall instruct all who are skillful, whom I have endowed with the gift of skill to make Aaron's vestments for consecrating him to serve me as priest. These are the vestments they are to make, a breastplate, a nephod, a robe, a fringed tunic, a headdress, and a sash. They shall make these sacral, sacral vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons for priestly service to me. They therefore shall receive the gold, the blue, purple, and crimson yarns in the fine linen. Okay, let's pause there. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. I find the most important word in the whole reading was the word tamid. Tamid, right. So let's go back and look at I, that. I, I'd like to go back even further to Tzavet. To yeah, let's which, go back to the, the first, let's go back to the first, the the first verse. The English to Correct. Tzavet is more like command. Right, it comes from the same shore. Did everybody hear, did everybody hear that? We're talking about the second word of the parsha, so the atat titzaveh. Command. So, command. Command right? comes from the Hebrew word mitzvah. Mitzvah. Yeah. Right. So you shall further instruct the Israelites. Instruct is the question. Is mm -hmm. that is that an accurate translation? No, not really. It's it is a directive. And if you were reading Rashi, if you had if anybody has Rashi in front of them, Rashi points this out says this is an unusual verb that's used normally. What does God normally say? Daber. Daber, right? God would- Oh, I should not ma'am. Right, so Esther, if, if you could just raise your hand, we're happy to include you. When you speak, it's very loud in here, and so it just sort of booms in. <laughs> it's unusual, but that, thank you. Um, so Titzaveh should like wake us up to a different reality here and say this is not a normal a run of the mill directive or commandment from God to Moses, but this is specifically, Moses gets the power to command. You shall command, right? Mm -hmm. So just like when God creates the world, people are then given the power to create, just like God has the power to create, we, we can create life. Here, Moses is given the power to command by God, command the people of Israel to do what? to bring clear oil, so shemen zait, so olive oil, shemen zait zach, a clear, a pure oil, um, of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling lamps regularly. Now, the process of creating olive oil, it takes time, right? It's not something you have to wait for a certain season. You have to press the oil in a certain way. You have to filter the oil. It's a, it's a laborious process, yeah. right? Yeah, and especially... Bye -bye. I yes, made yes, I made an experiment with my class back in Israel, and it really took seven days. Right. So where where else in in Jewish history or holidays do we find that the time it takes to make oil influences something? Yes. Hanukkah. Uh, right. Right. So one of the theories about why we have eight days of Hanukkah is because they needed that period of time in order to to make the oil to then continue lighting that lamp. 
And so the miracle of the oil that lasted eight days, why eight days? Why not just three days instead of one? That would have been a miracle too, but because it was needed until the new supply of oil was ready. It takes time. Yes, Ivan. Yeah, yeah. In, I'm reading the uh, Robert Alter translation here in commentary. He says that olive oil was not present in Egypt. In fact, they imported uh, uh, clear olive oil from Phoenicia and Canaan. So the question is, where did the Israelites wandering in the desert get olive oil? Right. They probably didn't run into a lot of olive trees. Right. Right. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, That's but you know, Esther, even they. Something? Yes, Esther, go ahead. There is no Mugdamon Meuchar Batora. So when they talk about it, maybe they're referring to what they would have done later. But what's interesting about the olive tree, it's the only tree that does not take, that you cannot combine with another tree. You know, like you have oranges and grapefruits and you combine them, you get a different fruit. You cannot do that to the olive tree. And also the Lucas, when it attacked Israel, it did not attack the olive tree. So some I don't like the leaf of the tree. Mm. I didn't know that. Right, so Esther's, Esther's interpretation here, right? Torah happens all at one time. There's no before or after is what she's referencing, which is a, you know, the classic understanding of how we study Torah. Things are meant to be interpreted. Uh, could, Esther, can you mute, please? Because I think there's some sound coming through. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the perennial. We don't, we don't have control. <laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, if you if you can, you can you can go ahead. Um, so, what is we have a symbol of this perpetual light in our sanctuaries today? right, the, the ner tamid that we yeah. have, right? Mm -hmm. It's not exactly this. This was not a ner tamid. It was not a singular light. This was lamps collected together, probably in some sort of menorah type fashion that was placed outside of the Ark of the Pact. And the Ark of the Pact and the tent of the meeting that was had to be brought each day. But there's a beautiful metaphor here that all Israel, so each individual had to bring this contribution of oil whether they were rich or they were poor, they, everybody had to bring this oil to continue to this community each day to continue the, the light that's there. Yes. Okay, now, now to go back to what Esther said before about Tamid, mm -hmm. you know, we sometimes it's interpreted as continuously, right. like near Tamid today. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's interpreted as regularly, Sometimes it's repeatedly, mm -hmm. um, like the Tamid offering, it's every day. Correct. It's not continuously. Right. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an important thing. I, I'm convinced that the near Tamid does not need to be burning 24 7. Right. Yeah, because but, the, the lamps in the, in the tabernacle were not running 24 7. Right. But they, they were not at night. They were each day, they were kindled it's regularly. Right. But not continuously. <clears throat> right. And that, that is, I think that's, from my opinion, a, a correct translation interpretation of this is a perpetual not not always burning but something that we would do each morning or each each night um yes other thoughts around the room yeah so did i get it right that what you meant to say was that at that time the state did not have the second the seventh arm menorah <clears throat> and the seven lights with the oil the olive oil were representative of a seven branch menorah, right? Right. Well, when, when we see the menorah described in the Torah, yes. Well, at that time, there was no concept of menorah at the time. Correct. It, it comes later. Yeah, it comes partial. later. Yeah, it comes later. It's in this part. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so let's, um, let's uh, other questions on this opening section about the light. Uh, other questions? Uh, Esther, you're, you're muted. You're, we, we muted you because there was noise in the background. Okay. Just when you're, all, back you're to the word Tamid, I think the basis of our religion, what is important is what we do regularly, all the time. You put film every day. You pray three times a day. The idea that of something that you do continuously is what is, as far as I'm concerned, is what's important in our religion. Correct. Uh, Correct. Yes. 
Yeah, this uh, Pasha has special relevance to me because my wife's yort site is today, mm. uh, my mother's rather, and, and when I think of it, the light, she was a light unto me. There's so many metaphors about light uh, right. in the secular world as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, right, and light is a constant metaphor across our texts, right? Good, holy. Yeah, but light, light, can, light can mean Torah and light can mean knowledge. Moving forward, Esther, thank you so much. We're moving forward, that's okay. Um, let's, just to take a look at, uh, let's go to verse 29, verse 38. Because we have here another regular experience. And this is the regular offering that we have. Correct. So we're on, this is page 515. Near the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's have someone else read this section beginning. Let's start with um, let's start with verse thirty-five to get into it, and then when we get to thirty-eight, we'll get to the section of the regular burnt offering, and we can see how that compares. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons, just as I have commanded you. You shall ordain them through seven days. And each day you shall prepare a bull as a purification offering for expiation. You shall pur purify the altar by performing purification upon it, and you shall anoint it to consecrate it. Seven days you shall perform purification for the altar to consecrate it, and the altar shall become most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become consecrated. Keep going? Yep, let's keep going. Now this is what you shall offer upon the altar, two yearling lambs each day, regularly. There's that word tamid again. Okay, keep going. You shall offer the one lamb in the morning, and you shall offer the other lamb at twilight. There shall be a tenth of a measure of choice flour with a quarter of a hin of beaten oil mixed in and a libation of a quarter hin of wine for one lamb and you shall offer the other lamb at twilight, repeating it with the grain offering of the morning with its libation, a gift for a pleasing odor to the Lord. A regular burnt offering throughout the generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. Right, so there we are, Olat Tamid, right? This regular offering that takes place. So is, is, the heap, is the English correct here? I mean, it, it says each day regularly. It's kind, kind of like, Repetitious. It is repetitious, it, right? Leyom tamid. That way also? Well, yes, yeah, shnaim leyom tamid. Like for each day, tamid. For each day, regularly, so perpetually. It really, does, it really is the same. Right. Okay. It is. It is redundant, right? You yeah. could just have stopped with for each day. Do this each day, but that extra tamid sort of adds that layer of this is routine, that, but an intentional routine that we're going to do each time. Which, I mean, is the framework for, for so many of our action-based mitzvot. Wake up in the morning, wash the hands, recite mode ani lefanecha. Before we eat, we say a blessing. Like all, you know, if we're, if we're really following and living in that, in that mitzvot environment, it's so root, it becomes very routine and guided and things at different moments in times. Do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Um, I'm curious for anyone, has anyone here found that there's a, a, a mitzvah or a, a, a Jewish ritual that you do on a regular basis? That's something that you have to do every day that you feel like adds something to your life. The yeah. Down okay. Followed by a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say the morning's cut uh, every day. Every day. Yeah. And I go to Minyan. Mm -hmm. Right, and that that can bring a sense of can bring a sense of calm to yeah, our lives. Yeah, it brings a sense yeah. of of security and and wholeness, and 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 really like as we build out, think about the whole community coming here every morning. It was somebody's responsibility to bring this oil, right? Rabbi, it's not a mitzvah. Yes. Right. But I get David and then Ivan and then Esther. will get to you again, okay? Uh, David, go ahead. I think the other thing it does, because I do some of these things daily also, is it makes you stop and appreciate 
if you just go about your daily business, which is sometimes very frenetic, mm -hmm. you can kind of forget to stop and appreciate, you know, the gift of life, if you will, and uh, and kind of forget about God, if you will, which we don't want to do. So some of these rituals, even the ones that seem a little strange, if nothing else, make us pause and stop and think and appreciate. Yeah. Very good. Ivan? Uh, it's interesting that uh, in this Parsha, the Moses is never mentioned. The name Moses is never mentioned. The only, the only Parsha from mm -hmm. Exodus to the end of Deuteronomy. And, um, you know, it it's, means that Aaron and his sons and the priesthood, which is comes into being. And of course, Moses is referred to, but he, uh, but Moses is a prophet and his routine is something that's carried out by the priests. Okay, Moses is a prophet. It's a more spontaneous profession. He deals, you know, with problems that come up uh, in his generation. But here we are concentrated on routine. And uh, 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 Jonathan Sachs talks about uh, uh, the uh, concept of uh, charisma. Moses was charismatic and he, was, he, he is gonna be leaving. In fact, he's not present, he's up on the mountain. Okay, and so this is how Judaism sustains itself as David and others have pointed out through routine. And the fact that Moses isn't mentioned in this Parsha, that he's a charismatic figure as opposed to Aaron, uh, who is the priest, is telling us something about how Judaism will survive in the future. Right. So Esther and then Sheila, and then we'll come back into this room. Yep. Going on on Ivan's comment, Rabbi Sachs actually says that Aaron and Moses is a separation of power. Right. Different checks for sure. Yep, Sheila. You got to unmute, Sheila. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my father in, in the 50s my father liked to joke with somebody in the building who liked to talk about the calisthenics he was doing every morning and he said well I do it too he said oh what do you do he says well I put on my tefillin and daven every morning <laughs> and basically that is what the, the tefillot are you put the tefillin on this is all meditation exercise it's a it's a daily thing mm -hmm. that requires you to do something other than uh earthly activities yeah right other than other than business if you look at it that way it all makes some sign, kind of sense right right yeah. i call my daughter every morning on, esther. esther hold on we have other people hold on i wanted to comment on what ivan said that the name of moses is not mentioned here and there is an explanation to this, which is that when the people of Israel sinned in the desert by making the golden calf, Moses was insisting to God that uh, erase that sin, erase that sin, erase that sin. If you don't erase it, da 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 da, and that is why his name kind of is erased from this mm. chapter of. Right. So of course that happens next week, right? We'll we'll get yeah. to that next week. Yep. To, to follow on on that point. Moshe is not mentioned in this Parsha, but this entire monologue is God talking to Moshe. Right. That, that's number one. Number two is this Parsha is always read just before Purim, where God is no to move the deal. Right. <laughs> that's a beautiful, interesting symbol. To go back to, to Ivan's point for one more second, right? We can relate. We can relate to the work of Aaron much more so than we can relate to the prophetic experience of Moses, right? I mean, for most of us, I'm making an assumption. I, you know, I what voices might come to you at certain moments in your life, right? But um, on a daily basis, our experience is much more like that of Aaron and his sons, actual specific actions that we do 
in our lives, whether ritual or, or mundane or with work or whatever it is, things that we do with our hands and our bodies. And Moses' dialogue here, we could assume is some sort of spiritual or oral experience. It's not with his hands. He's learning this information from God um, through a type of prophetic experience. And, and that's not something that, he, that we generally expect to achieve in our lives. And then there's also the, the tension in theory between, you know, do we, do we wait to do a mitzvah to find, because we are expecting to find a spiritual experience in that moment, or do we come back, Hamid, regularly, mm -hmm. come up to the, you know, they, they use the baseball metaphor, right? You, you don't hit a home run every time you come up to the plate. You don't experience a, a sense of spiritual connection every time you put on the tefillin, mm -hmm. right? But to do so each time gives you more opportunities for that, creates the space for those things. All right, real quick, Esther, and then we're going to move forward, okay? Go ahead. Just, just going on what Bijan was saying about not mentioning the name of uh, Moses, it is it happened a few times in the Torah where you have to know that the power of speech is to is silence. And Jacob with Rachel wasn't silent and he paid for it. Moses, when he said, you can erase my name, paid for it. And when the man said the first person will come out of the house, I will sacrifice. So we have to be very careful what we say. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, so you just mentioned Purim, right? So this Parsha is read pretty much every year right before Purim. Mm -hmm. And we can take, for those of you in the room, take a look at the handout that I, that I passed around. And for those online, we'll make sure to read the things that are here out loud for you. But basically, what the handout is, um, is speaking about the, the meaning of this Shabbat, of Shabbat Zachor. That this is the Shabbat that focuses on the commandment that we get from Deuteronomy to remember what Amalek did to the Israelites. So we have three commandments that are actually there in Deuteronomy, in chapter 25 of Deuteronomy. Zachor at Amalek, remember what Amalek did to the Israelites, mm -hmm. to wipe out the descendants of Amalek, to, to get rid of them all. Three, don't forget Amalek's atrocities and ambush on our journey from Egypt in the desert. So remember, wipe out, and then don't forget. So we have two, two of those three commandments are are things that could happen at all time, right? We might not know who Amalek's descendants are. We have certainly related that thematically to um, different foes of the Israelites and the Jewish people over the years. Um, however, <clears throat> to remember and not to forget. What's the difference between those two things? What is it in Hebrew? I know Zachor, but what is not to forget? Don't forget. What is the Hebrew oh. word? Esther, say it loud. Al tishkach. Right. right. I, I think that we had enemies in every generation, but I think the Torah picks on Amalek because Amalek, first of all, was the first one to attack us as a nation. Correct. And, and even though he knew that till, till that moment, people feared the Jews. So what Amalek did, he... He took away the fear of fighting the Jews. And this is why he is our arch enemy. Because we had enemies throughout the generation, but to pick on Amalek because he was the first one, not just to fight us in, in anti Semitism, but to take away the awe that people had of us. That's a good point, Esther. And also attacking from behind, right? Attacking the weak parts of the, of the community who maybe if they were wandering as a group or marching together through the, the pathways, an enemy that would come up behind would find the people who are the stragglers, right? The people who are slower, the children, the elderly, um, the, this idea of attacking people who, who are most vulnerable. Yes. What, what I was going to say is this is just another example of the Torah having a positive and a negative commandment about the same thing. Correct. Right. That's a good point, right? Mm -hmm. Zachor is like, remember, al tishkach, don't forget, hmm. right? Um, so there's a lot of symbolism about Amalek in the story of Purim. 
mm -hmm. um, the lineage of Haman. I have to say boo when you say that. <laughs> the lineage of Haman is connected to that of Amalek in the in the stories. We've never well, that. No, it doesn't. Um, and and, I, and and the text that I brought today sort of bring us through where 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 we learn about this character. So let's take a moment to turn back to Genesis. Genesis 36, verse 12. I'll give you a page number in one second. That'll be page 217 in the Eitz Chaim. 36, verse 12. <clears throat> So we have here uh, the descendants of, or verse 10, actually, the descendants of Esau, right? So what does Esau represent? Metaphorically, symbolically? Hey, um, I'm not right. Right. We, have, we have Jacob, who represents the quintessential Jewish person at home, studying, learned. We know the Midrash about when Jacob was in his mother's womb. Jacob and Esau was, was in the womb that she would pass by the Bate Midrash and Jacob would be fighting to get out. And when she would pass by the, 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 the brothels, Esau would try to get out, right? Well, Esau is Edom. Esau is Edom and Edom is Amalek. Right. So, um, right. And it says right here, chapter 36, Esau, this is the line of Esau. And then there's a gloss, right, in addition to the text. That is a dome. Whenever you see the Torah, a text like that where there's a doesn't make sense and there's like an explanation or something, that's called a gloss in biblical uh, biblical studies. It's a, probably a later editor went in and said we need to clarify what that means. So this is the line of Esau, the Edom, who Edom, um, which is an enemy of Israel, an enemy of the Israelites. So this is the line of Esau's sons, verse ten. And it goes through all of them down to, we get to, 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 to verse 12, Timnah. Timnah was a concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. So this is the first reference of Amalek in the Torah. And, and Amalek is a descent, is the son of Eliphaz and Esau's concubine, Timnah. Okay. So... You would say, why is this name referenced here? What is this? This is going to come back. Things that are here are important. will come back to us later in the story. So what is this? Who is this Timna? What is her story? So on the handout in the middle of the bottom of the page, I brought a passage from the Babylonian Talmud, Masechet Sanhedrin, page 99b. And it says that the rabbis ask, Mar asks, what is the purpose of writing and Lotan's sister was Timna. That's what we get here in, in uh, chapter 36. It goes on to explain who Timna was. Why, why is Timna important? Well, they say Timna was a royal princess desiring to convert to Judaism. She went to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they did not accept her. So she went and became a concubine to Eliphaz son of Esau, saying, I had rather be a servant to this people than a mistress of another nation. From her, Amalek descended, who afflicted Israel. Lama, because they should not have repulsed her. So there's a lesson that the rabbis bring here in sort of midrashic twist. What happens when we turn someone away uh, from the uh, Jewish people? It leads to bad things over time. Uh, so that's an interesting read about the history of Amalek. Oh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. So I have a question about this. So yeah. uh, two things. I know that like in terms of practical practice, we tend to be kind of hard to, we tend to be a faith that's hard to convert to. We're demanding on convert. Yeah. Um, does this imply something like that, or was there some kind of blemish on her that they that that our forefathers would have turned her away? I mean, at this time, we don't know why she was turned away. Hard to know, but you notice that there's three names listed here: Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? We know the 
the concept that a lot of converts will say, oh, you have to turn me away, Rabbi, three times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> a righteous convert to Israel. That <coughs> comes from this, that's symbolized here. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question. I don't know enough about Timna's history or if there's more references. Um, but I find this the symbolism in terms of how we welcome people who want to be part of our faith in into Jew, Jewish life. By the, we don't. Yeah. yeah, perhaps we or we didn't back then, right? I think there's a there's a fear among converts today that we won't, right? People who come to us, there's a <laughs> worry. Yes. I think that and then we'll get to those online. Yeah. It's not that we don't want them to come to us and be part of us. But we put demand on them. We want them to be a certain kind, a certain thing, a certain behavior, a certain knowledge. So, in my opinion, that is really why the Jewish people, instead of being very, very strong in numbers, they are rather strong in quality. It's like a spoon of salt that you put in a cup as opposed to put that into a jar. Sure, it's right. more mm -hmm. concentrated. Yeah, well, there's nothing wrong with intellectual rigor and learning, so learning that's what the it texts is. and learning that's all of the rituals. That's important. But I would say that's equally important for the individual, right? Yeah. Someone comes in and they don't, they don't understand. There's so much insider language and terms and holidays and, and details that we sort of take for granted someone coming in would feel always on the outside, if not for learning those things. Let's get David, he has his hands up. Go ahead, David. So I, I think two things. One is that there's a kind of a dialectic tension here that exists in a number of areas, I think, in Judaism, certainly among the rabbis of the Talmud, when they're arguing, and sometimes we're actually doing the minority uh, opinion. Sure. Uh, at the at our stage in, in in time, so to speak. So I'll just say that that clearly there are times when we seem to be more welcoming, and we point out that some of our most active members with the most knowledge are those who are Jews by choice. And at other times, you might hear somebody in the congregation whispering, as when I was a child, uh, "Oh, so and so is a convert." In their heart of hearts, they're really not Jewish. And I don't, I don't like that latter one. I like the former one better, but there is that ongoing tension that may be reflected uh, in what was being read. And then the other thing I'll just observe, and I think this is typical of perhaps of Agadah and the Talmud and maybe Midrash in general, which is that you often have contradictions. And I think that's literally because somebody at one time or another was making a different homiletical point then at another point, and I'll give credit to uh, Rabbi uh, Artson uh, at University of Judaism for that uh, uh, insight. I learned that with him and from him, and I, I think it really informs one's understanding of Midrash a lot better uh, if, if one understands that actual historic reality about it. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah reflects reality all the time, right? We have lots of difference of opinion. David, I wonder how what you're saying, the that tension uh, that you mentioned on the two sides of, of you know, welcoming versus feeling, uh, versus shunning, really. I mean, what does that relate to being a, min a minority group, right? Do we feel tension around people also joining in to have to be part of a minority status. Yeah, I think that what I would say about that is that on the one hand, as a rather small minority, we are maybe more uh, concerned with self-preservation of the group than majorities ever have to be. The majorities just don't have to think about that. They're, uh, the way my mother, a blessed memory, used to put it, uh, is that uh, we have Christmas all around us because we have Christians all around us. It's just taken for granted, and you just have to deal with it that that it's there. Uh, and 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 when things might be bad, you could say to yourself, "Well, at least they're celebrating that time of year," rather than blaming the Jews for putting you know who on a cross. 
but uh, not Voldemort. But anyway, uh, uh, I think that's that's part of it is is the sense of how you self preserve. So it could be that part of that dialectical tension, if you will, is that yeah, if we're welcoming, that's great because maybe then we're growing and we're bringing in fresh blood and and different perspectives and somebody who's really eager uh, about their Judaism in a way that maybe some of us who were born into Judaism aren't as eager. On the other hand, what if we're overwhelmed by a horde of people who change everything? Yeah, yeah, all of those things. Yes, Sheila, then Esther. Thanks for raising your hand, Esther. We'll get to you right next. Sheila? Uh, you have the same thing though, economically and socially. In other words, if you are, if you send, if you marry someone rich, or I should say someone prominent and rich, um, you are in a different class, and therefore you also are not, um, like you're talked about behind your back, that, oh, so-and-so is from, they only went to uh, CSU, they didn't go to Yale. There's a, there's a snobbish, snobism. Uh, we like to refer to people who came over on the Mayflower. And uh, what's interesting is, you would think that the black, the African Americans would also have um, assumed some some sort of uh, ladder of prominence. You know that if you came from such and such country, I think we have that actually among the Africans today. In other words, there are some from when you well, let's take the example even of a doctor from certain countries, you accept them more than from other countries because you don't say the education is better or, you know, they have, they've learned English, they different. have a higher yeah. standard. So it's not just, you know, the Jews who do this. For sure. No, no, no. I'm just, I, I just think there's an element here about sort of, have you lived the experience, right? We, we right. see it in, in the tension that we sometimes have as Jews between ourselves and the black community, we talk about our different histories of struggle, right? We sometimes claim that we can relate to their history of struggle in the United States, but they might say, well, no, you're not really part of this. You don't know what this is like. But even, but even <laughs> Jews, if you have a Jew who didn't celebrate anything and doesn't care or comes from a very reformed background, he feels out of it in say, I'm not even talking about a Hasidic community. I'm talking about a modern Orthodox or even a conservative synagogue because he doesn't know what's going on. Okay, Esther, you had your hand up and then we'll, we'll come to you. Uh, I, uh, there's one point that I think we didn't talk about so much and I thought was important, the connection between Purim and this week's parasha. And this is the closing because I think that closing are very important. They make a statement. They show respect. The judge dresses differently. The military dresses differently. The police differently. Different sports groups dress differently. So the clothing that we spend so much time this parasha on Aaron's clothes, right? And you talk about pulling and the clothing. To me, it's very important. We dress for Shabbat when we go to shul, and even when I'm on Zoom, if it's Shabbat, I will dress. That's a great point, Esther. We're going to hold that for one second. I want to come back to that. Go ahead. Well, I think Judy. we have to be cautious about stereotyping, assuming that certain things will bind people together, race, culture, religion, socioeconomic status. I remember very clearly a wonderful student from, I think he was from Nigeria, who stood up in front of a class and said, I can't stand them. He came to Cleveland not too long ago. At that point, can't stand them. Who would be the them? He was speaking about the inner city African American blacks. I can't stand them. He felt they could relate more closely to people of, of uh, Caucasians mm -hmm. who had his values and kind of upbringing. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Right. The lines are not always clearly defined. Judy. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, Dan. Um, I'm I'm intrigued going back to this midrash about Timna that if I'm understanding, if I'm connecting the dots on this and tell me if I am, um, mm -hmm. the rabbis are basically giving some rationale for what was the cause of, of uh, Amalek being uh, this, you know, the, the, the Darth Vader, you know, of the Jewish people, the, you know, this, this sort of evil icon. 
And to link it back to his parentage of a story of rejection um, of, you know, beyond non-inclusiveness, just outright rejection is very powerful. You know, I mean, like they, they, they're actually like saying, well, what would make a person turn in this way? You know, um, it's very cautionary, you know, and we're all talking about what does it mean to uh, embrace for the, versus distance people? Um, how do we really feel like people are part of something and not part of something? This is a story that speaks to it in some really harsh and extreme ways that, you know, this could be the outcome of <laughs> this kind of behavior. I don't, that's just sort of some of the thoughts I'm connecting on it. Maybe that I'm off base, but that was something I, I was wondering about. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a word of caution. I mean, for those of us who have worked, I don't know if this congregation has meant like a mentoring program for folks who are choosing a Jewish path in life at the congregation where I work in Dallas. We saw a lot of interest in conversion. Um, many, many folks from the, who had grown up in evangelical communities feeling outcast from them for reasons of gender, sexual identity, sexual orientation, um, or just general values and beliefs and sort of coming to uh, into their adulthood and their eyes opening up and saying like this, this is not right, like this is not what I believe, but still on a spiritual search for a way to connect and finding the values of, of what I would collectively call progressive Jewish communities, conservative and reform, um, finding that quite appealing to them. And then coming, we would have congregational mentors who would work with them something like 35 people a year would come to our congregation to convert to Judaism. It's a couple of year process for them, but um, just, but they, each, each one at some point would always express a fear that we would turn them away. Yeah. Always express whether that was a, like a subtle fear. Are people talking about me? Um, sort of a, what we heard from Ivan before or uh, the more, or, or David before, but the more the direct, uh, you know, is, uh, is the rabbi or the cantor going to not, not be interested in talking to me because I'm not part of this community yet. It's just, it's interesting. Yeah. The tradition is to turn them away three times. So they, they get it from somewhere. Right. <laughs> but, but my, my question was about Amalek himself. Yeah. Are we to believe that the Amalek that was born to this generation that we're talking about here is the same Amalek that attacked the, the Israelites coming out of Egypt? Uh, or is it his namesake or descendant? Right. So if we're talking, if we're, if we're siding with Esther's interpretation of Torah, this is the same Amalek, right? That's, so, that's and this is his believe. this that's is his background. This is where he's coming from. For the sake of the story of the narrative, this is Amalek. So let's take a look where else he comes up. So uh, at Exodus seventeen, Exodus seventeen eight. A few weeks ago, that was the attack. Too far. Uh, page 420, 420. They came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, pick some men for us and go to do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow, I'll station myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses... Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held his hands up, Israel prevailed, and he let his hands down. Amalek prevailed. Moses' hands grew heavy. They took a stone and put it under him. Um, Aaron and Hur, on one on each side, supported his hands. Thus his hands remained steady until the sun set, and Joshua overwhelmed the people of Amalek with the sword. Um, inscribe this for all time. I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So that's the that's the, the scene of battle. On page two of our handout, Rashi picks up on an unusual phrase that is in chapter 17, verse 8. I'll read it to us here for one second. The Yavo Amalek, and up came Amalek upon the people. Um, Scripture places, this is Rashi's words here, Scripture places this section immediately after the preceding verse, the preceding, the, the preceding verse in the text of, of Exodus is, is Adonai bekurbenu im, im ayin. 
that God is present among us. God is with us. So Rashi is doing what's called a doresh simuchin, a comparison of two things that lie next to each other in the texts and drawing symbolism out of that, of the order that's there. So God is with us. And then all of a sudden, Amalek is attacking. There's meaning here in these two, uh, these two placed, placed items. So he says, Rashi says, scripture places this section immediately after the verse. Is, is God among us or not? To imply, I am ever among you and ready at hand for everything you may need. And yet you say, is the Lord among us or not? So why question God? I'm always there. By your lives, I swear that Amalek, the hound, right? This is a nickname for Amalek, shall come and bite you and you will cry for me and then you will know where I am. So as, as this Ra Rashi's read is here, evil exists in the world to remind us of God's presence in the world. An interesting read. A parable. It might be compared to a man who carried his son upon his shoulder and went out on a journey. The son saw an article on the ground and said, Father, pick up that thing and give it to me. He gave it to him. And so a second time and a third time, they met a certain man whom the son said, have you seen my father anywhere? <laughs> his father said to him, don't you know where I am? He therefore cast him off from his shoulders and a hound came up and bit him. <laughs> sort of things, things in the world that remind you <laughs> lovely stories I, I want to relate this to, to poor yeah and that's is the lord among us or not is the yin mcgill or not not right it's, it's, it's well it's all the themes of costumes of the dress right which we connect here here our ritual leaders in tetzave are all dressed in garb in costume right the purim story god is hidden Name Esther right, means hiddenness. Yes. Uh, and Esther. God is hidden from that story. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in this verse. Is God, is the Lord among us or not? Mm -hmm. And that's why his name is in the Megillah. We're trying to prove whether he's there or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but that, is a, that is an eternal question, right? And all of our modern theologians in trying to grapple with the terrors of the Shoah Mm -hmm. struggle to understand God's presence in the world. Martin Buber mm -hmm. theorized this was a time that the Shoah was a time where God's eternal thou presence in the world had receded for a period of time and wasn't present. Yeah, Ivan. So basically, uh, Amalek becomes a, an eternal symbol uh, as an enemy of God. Correct. Okay, and even uh, in the, you know, relating it to, to Purim, I don't know if we mentioned this before, Haman uh, was considered a descendant of Amalek. That's correct. On page four of our handouts, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Ivan, keep going. If you were going to say more. Uh, no, I mean, that, you know, that's it. You know, it's, it's, you have to think of it more as a symbol. Correct, correct. So page four, I, I brought a couple of verses from Esther, which reference this, and then we'll get to David in a second. Esther chapter three, verse one reads, sometime afterwards, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatta, the Agagite. He advanced him and seated him higher than any his, of his fellows. So we see the lineage of Haman connected to Amalek through Agog. And who was Agog? Any scholars of the book of Samuel? David? Yeah, the king of the uh, Amalekites that Saul spared. And then uh, he's uh, slain by, uh, by Samuel. Um, and apparently, one could argue, therefore, that in sparing him long enough to have had a lineage, we get the problem of uh, of uh, Haman and the, in the Purim story. Yeah. What I was going to comment on though, uh, in relationship to, to what had been said before is that I think you can also read it going in the other direction, uh, which is to say that um, one of the problems with the Amalekites is there's no Yirat, HaShema, Yirat Shemayim. Um, so if part of our job is to be a light under the nations, 
somehow or another, we're not a light to uh, Amalek on the one hand. Maybe that's an impossible task and that's why we have to blot Amalek out. But it, I think it, it just reflects on some of the reality in the world that some people are brutal and uh, reject the idea that there's any, uh, any God to hold them accountable for that anywhere at all. And other people are restrained perhaps precisely because they understand the world to be organized around some kind of uh, principles of uh, morality that involve a, not an allegiance in a sense to God, but also a uh, reverence, uh, a sense that there are consequences, even when there don't appear to be any consequences. Um, and maybe it's a continuum. I, I don't know really how to describe that in terms of how different people react and how different groups of people react. But I think that part part of what you see in this story of Amalek attacking the rear guard and then the attempts to uh, wipe out Amalek, which seem to go on in every generation, reflect that that problem of who is reverent and who is completely irreverent and what are the consequences of that in terms of their actions towards other human beings. Um, so I, I, and I think maybe that's part of what the symbolism of holding Moshe's arms up is about. It's, it's not that it's magic. It's more about what are Moshe's hands being up about. They're being up about uh, about God and God's presence, one could argue. And therefore, uh, when they're up is when the Israelites can prevail because you can't see God and live, but you can see Moshe's hands up as an expression of reverence to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Esther, go ahead. I don't remember where I read it, if it was Chazal or psychology, but they claimed that even though Ahasuerus raised Haman, he actually feared him. And that's why he couldn't sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> Azal and, and, and psychology are, are intimately connected, as we know. Yeah, but I really Absolutely. don't remember where I read it, but I thought it was an interesting way of looking at it. From in here, I, uh, Sheila and then Ivan. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this or not, but is Amalek, an actual country, nation or whatever, or has Amalek become really a symbol of an enemy? Yes. And, and we call, and we call, like we call um, Hitler, Heyman, anybody who is, uh, any um, gentleman who's been an enemy, has become an enemy of the Jews, becomes a Heyman. Correct. And Hitler, I mean, Hitler has become for the uh, American or for for right. our generation also a symbol right. of an enemy. In every generation, an enemy will rise up. In exactly. every generation, we have to look at ourselves as just coming out of Egypt. In every generation, a hero or sage comes to our aid, right? So these all these sort of these uh, these tropes exist. Yes, nation. Yes, symbol right, becomes a symbol, what happened in the past we relate through. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then I wanna make sure we get to, to Ivan, um, and, and we had a couple of hands in here and we're at 10 o'clock as well. But um, the question of, do we, do we fully eliminate the enemy? You know, the part of the Purim story that usually doesn't appear in the spiel on, mm -hmm. on Saturday morning or Sunday morning, whenever you do it here, um, right? The uh, Esther, and the end of the book of Esther, chapter nine, the question is, should, as they're, if they're warring and destroying all of Haman's uh, descendants, all of his sons, <clears throat> she says, if it please your majesty, let the Jews in Shushan be permitted to act tomorrow as also they did today and let Haman's 10 sons be impaled on the stake. It's very clear in the book of Esther that they take, take care of the entire group in contrast to what happened with um uh with in, in the book in the book of samuel so uh it's just not, 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 i think there were more sons 
I think there were more than 10 sons because I thought Kabbalah converted and became rabbis. Or is that just Midrash? Probably Midrash. Okay, we have a couple more comments and then we'll um, conclude. Yes. It's interesting that you're talking about Amalek um, and Haman and Hashverosh and Esther and Puri. Just this week, they found a new archaeological artifact in Israel, a piece of clay with the name of Darius, who is the son of Ahasuerus, who possibly is, who possibly his mother might be Esther. <laughs> so who possibly can be Jew by definition. <laughs> so the piece of clay was about this big with the very clear name of Darius. I am Darius, the son of Ahasuerus and so on and so forth. And uh, both the name Cyrus and Darius are very common names for boys in that part of the world, especially among Jews. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, this may be a far stretch and not in accord with the Torah narrative, but is there such a thing? I really think it would be great if we could define what exactly an enemy is. Uh, is there such a thing as an enemy within? Within. When I grew up, we had conservative reform and Orthodox <laughs> Judaism. Today, we have all kinds of variations in and between and among, mm -hmm. and people who won't speak to each other or present themselves publicly in a forum if they come from a different Jewish camp. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, we want to hopefully overcome those difficulties. I'm sure, right. I mean, the, one of the texts I brought speaks about more personally, tension between the Yetzir HaTov, the Yetzir HaRa, and is this, we want to remember the fact that we have good and bad inside ourselves as well, yeah. and have to manage those things. Well, thank you for inviting me into your community today. At one point, I was going to move. Thank you.